and the topic as we all know in the flyer that has been circulated so the topic for the talk today is a systematic review on slum eviction literature what can we learn from failures of the past and i'm not getting into much details over to you namesh so that you make the full presentation and the, as we discussed the format is 40 to 45 minutes of your presentation and then it's better to take questions after that Thank so, you. Good. Over to you. All right. Thank you so much, Keita. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for all those who've taken the time to join in today. Um, what I'm presenting here is part of a large project that I had conceptualized together with my dissertation advisor, Dr. Amit Patel, from the McCormack School of Policy Studies at UMass Boston. And finally, we have been able to start working on it since July 2021. Um, to provide a quick summary of this project, we aim to undertake an extensive systematic review of existing slum literature to understand the effectiveness of all the policy ideas that have been tried on slums so far, and thus examine their effectiveness in the light of past experiences around this world. Through the systematic review, we aim to answer questions such as, how do policymakers decide which policy to pursue in a given slum context? Or how do they know that a policy will achieve its stated objectives and improve housing conditions for slum dwellers? Or even how do they know between rather a limited number of policies that have been tested for, impro for improving the lives of the urban poor? Um, as I said, this is a work in progress. The presentation today specifically focuses on understanding slum eviction literature with an objective to generate an, an evidence base on the effectiveness of slum evictions to understand what makes governments across the world rely on evictions as a primary base of slum development. So before I move to the specific details, let me spend some time providing a brief overview on why such a study is even necessary. Over a billion people or one in seven people on this planet live in slums today. And this population is expected to rise in the coming decades. Slums are densely populated and neglected parts of cities where housing and access to basic services such as water and sanitation are poor. Um, according to the UN Habitat definition of slums, a slum household is defined as a group of individuals um, living under the same roof who lack one or more of the following, access to improved water, access to improved sanitation, security of tenure, durable housing, and sufficient living space. It is estimated that 3 billion people will need adequate and affordable housing by the year 2030. Despite several policy interventions to improve the lives of the urban poor, none of them have been a panacea and slums continue to persist in the global south. With increasing rates of urbanization, slum policies will only grow, slum population will only grow if no policy actions are taken. While there is a long history of designing, implementing and evaluating slum policies, there is a very limited understanding of what makes certain policies effective and what kind of socioeconomic and political circumstances enable them to succeed their stated objectives and whether they are replicable in other contexts with a reasonably warranted success. As I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, there has been a long history of slum policies globally, first during the industrialization area and then in the last seven decades or so, especially in the global south. Surprisingly though, slum policies have only revolved around six major ideas that focus on improving housing and living conditions and slums. First, it started with literally doing nothing. And that was with an assumption that slums are temporary and transient and will disappear with economic growth. This was followed by construction of public housing, which involved demolition and forced evictions and is often offered as a replacement of demolished slums. And then the 70s were associated with primarily with the sites and service program that was largely promoted by the World Bank, which provided service to land parcels to slum dwellers, most often in periphery of the cities, um, and which where it expected the, uh, the slum dwellers to build their own homes that meet building standards. It was the fail, it was the uh, large scale failure of these sites and services that policymakers started realizing the advantages of in situ slum upgradation which happens, which remains the least contested policy idea as such, but still has varying levels of effectiveness. Um, in situ upgradation was then completed with tenure security after it was promoted by De Soto, who argued that providing legal rights to the land and houses that poor 
uh, occupied de facto could unlock the financial potential hidden in the form of their informal homes, which in turn could alleviate poverty. Despite this, the idea has been heavily criticized. The policy option remains popular even today. In the last two decades, discussions have started moving towards an idea of making cities slum free, which is mostly a rhetoric which no specific policy prescription as such, while programs such as the Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana and the previously implemented Rajiv Avas Yojana in India may have elements of the above listed interventions, but in itself, slum free city has been more of a goal rather than an intervention. Then adequate housing has been increasingly accepted as a human right and is considered important from an urban equity and inclusion perspective. The MDGs in the beginning of this century, albeit with modest goal of improving the lines of 100 million slum dwellers and the ambitious sustainable development goals more recently have called for renewed policy attention and increased investments to ensure affordable and adequate housing for all by 2030. Historically, most of the slum development programs and policies have been some form of either one of these major policy ideas or a mix and match of one of more of this. However, it is important to note that evictions have been embedded in some policies while removing this threat uh, in some ways or the other. While evictions have never been considered as an official policy, it is still seen as an ongoing activity in urban areas facilitated by different policies, by local governments and courts to enforce property rights and often also illegally by goons to claim properties. We are undertaking a much larger review of these policies in the long run, but today I'm going to focus on just one of them, that is evictions. Excuse me. Therefore, the primary objective of this project is to conduct a systematic review of available evidence for slum evictions to create an evidence base to help policymakers in making informed policy decisions. Now, this project has both scholarly and practitioner-oriented goals. In terms of the scholarly goals, we aim to create a taxonomy of evictions for meaningful discussions and frameworks to study them. At the same time, we aim to create a global living, uh, a global living database of eviction studies for other researchers as a starting point, creating a handy resource for someone who wants to study on slums. Um, we review articles that bring state-of-the-art knowledge base, providing a detailed understanding on what has been done, and thus accordingly identify the gaps in current literature. From a practitioner-oriented perspective as well, we want the literature to inform us when eviction as a slum improvement policy can make sense. Accordingly, we identify factors that help carry out evictions if they must be carried out. And then accordingly, we emphasize on the pitfalls that practitioners must avoid to design and implement eviction policies. Such a review will identify effective policies as well as what factors make them succeed. Our systematic review focuses on slum policies designed and implemented in the last seven decades from 1950s to the present to generate an ev evidence base of their effectiveness. A large number of previous reviews of slum policies have been conducted in the last few decades. However, they have primarily focused on either to describe the evolution of slum policies over time or to understand the impact of slum interventions on health outcomes. The first type of reviews explain the historic evolution of slum policies over a long time period, either globally or in the context of a specific country or city. The major goal of these reviews have been to document the history of slum policies, how they came out and evolved over time in a specific geographic context. It is important to note that these reviews are often conducted by international development researchers and not necessarily systematic reviews as understood in the field of evidence-based healthcare, where the methodology has emerged and developed into one of the strongest review methods in social sciences. The second type of systematic reviews are indeed the traditional systematic reviews and aptly folks focus on understanding the implications of slum policy interventions on variety of health outcomes such as child health, diarrhea, and other diseases. These systematic reviews have focused on the outcomes of the slum upgrading programs, but do not focus on effectiveness of policies in terms of achieving their immediate outcomes name, uh, related to housing conditions or improvement in living conditions. While improved health may be an ulterior motive for any intervention, 
slump policies are only a small part of many other inputs required to attain such a goal. On the other hand, slump policies have multiple objectives in addition to better health comes such as other socioeconomic and political outcomes to alleviate poverty, recognizing the right of the city, and achieving urban equity and inclusion, to name the few. While both types of reviews discussed above are in the context of slum policies, they provide limited evidence on the effectiveness of slum policies for achieving their intended outcomes on housing and living conditions, let alone on other policy goals such as equity and inclusion, often the main interest and driver for policymakers. This paper aims to bridge that gap and create an evidence base that both scholars and practitioners working with slum populations may find useful. Uh, traditional systematic reviews, as I was saying, aim to provide an up-to-date summary of the state of research knowledge on an intervention, diagnostic test, prognostic factor, or any other health or healthcare topic, which was primarily started by the Cochrane Library in the domain of healthcare research. A systematic review attempts to collate all the empirical evidence that fits pre-specified eligibility criteria in order to answer a specific research question. It uses explicit, systematic methods that are selected with a view to minimize bias, thus providing more reliable findings from which conclusions can be drawn and decisions made. What we are doing is an extension or an adjustment of a systematic review that suits the understanding of existing literature on slump policies so that it can fulfill our research objectives. Thus, keeping this in mind, let me move to the methodology. Um, our project is primarily divided into three stages, or let's say the data collection process. The first step involved an extensive search of all published literature in databases, such as JSTOR, EBSCO, Google Scholar, Nexus Uni, ProQuest, SSCI, and ScienceDirect. For this presentation, uh, I limit my search only to SSCI and JSTOR results for the papers that were published between 1950 and 2019 where we used search terms such as slum evictions and informal settlement evictions. We went through every search result that came out of the search, such as, as you can see in the screenshot from a JSTOR result, where what we did was we carefully reviewed each and every abstract to identify the relevant papers for our study. Now, this idea of determining what was relevant and what was not came from a pilot study where Amit and I independently studied 30 abstracts randomly from two different journals to identify a set of parameters on the basis of which we could determine if a, policy, if a particular paper was a policy paper or not. Once both, once both the authors independently categorized the first 30 papers, the two lists were compared to identify the number of mismatch cases in our categorization. Then both of us discussed our choices towards building a final consensus. Such an exercise helped us in inductively defining categories of policy and non-policy studies. However, we also came across many papers where we struggled to classify them as a clear policy paper or a non-policy paper. Therefore, we had to come up with a third category called semi-policy papers. So based on our pilot study, we came forward with these definitions of what we called as a policy study, as a semi-policy study, and a non-policy study. We were primarily interested in papers that were evidence-based, focused on a specific policy or a program, or whose implications were directly related to provision of housing and basic services. For the sake of convenience, uh, any papers not related to housing and basic services in slums were identified as non-policy papers. Semi-policy papers were those that did not have to be evidence-based, but did have some discussion on policy implications. Based on these definitions, once these were fixated, we started with the second step that involved the categorization of each and every abstract we found from the search reviews, um, which we did, uh, which both the authors did independently. Uh, both of us would met every week, and we still have been meeting every week to compare our lists. Uh, where we compare our categorization of the abstracts. In the beginning, while there were substantial differences when we started this categorization process, the number of such differences came down to negligible numbers in the few weeks as we fixed our parameters to what we defined as a policy paper, semi-policy paper, or a non-policy paper. 
all of this categorization of abstracts and coding of policy and semi-policy papers was done using this reference, reference management software of Zotero, where um, as we added each paper, let me put my pointer. Yeah, where as we added each paper, what we would do, we would also uh, categorize them in folders, as you can see on the left, in terms of for every journal, like uh, for this particular folder of slum eviction JSTOR, which means in the database of JSTOR, using the tag of slum evictions, we started categorizing them into unique policy papers, unique semi-policy papers, and so on. And for each of these papers, we would also identify relevant tags that, that would come in in the third step, which I'll talk in the next slide. So. Now, uh, after categorizing these papers, the next step involved this independent review of the policy papers, of the full policy papers, by both of us who would engage in the primary coding of the papers, based on which we were able to identify the multiple themes. So as we identified the policy papers, we would read those papers in detail, come up with an annotated bibliography, and we would have a discussion on our on our. Uh, on our individual annotated bibliographies for both the papers. And from there, we start identifying the prevalent themes, resolve any differences, and integrate ideas from which we could identify what was the key highlight of such paper. Thus, having started in July 2021, this is where we are as of now. Uh, we have completed the review of all policy papers found in Social Science Citation Index and are midway reviewing policy papers from JSTOR. Uh, we have reviewed 21 policy papers from 700 abstracts approximately in JSTOR um, that we've categorized so far. Looking at the trends, we expect to find another 60 policy papers approximately in JSTOR under slum evictions, key, uh, under, under, the key, under the keyword of slum evictions, and uh, 80 policy papers approximately from the keyword of informal settlement evictions. Altogether, we are expecting to review approximately 200 policy papers which we hope to finish sometime in the next three to four months, fingers crossed for that. Um, the findings that I discussed today is based on the preliminary analysis of the 58 policy papers that we have reviewed so far. So we used a grounded approach to identify the primary themes from which all the policy papers could be analyzed. We came up with six prevalent themes that we identified from this preliminary analysis on the basis of which we are trying to advance our theories on slum evictions. So the six themes that we could find uh, that we wanted to fo focus on was on evictions, triggers, excuse me, use of linguistics as a tool to exercise power, modes of evictions, impacts of evictions, and stakeholders involved. In the interest of time, I will be primarily focusing on the themes of location, triggers, and linguistics for today's presentation. The first theme of location highlights and observes where these evictions happened. So based on the 58 policy papers we reviewed, we found that the primary focus of most of these papers was either on South Asia or in the African continent, with approximately 75% of the papers studying slums in these two regions. The most papers we found were either based out of India or South Africa. However, it is also important to observe that there were few papers from countries in the global north, such as the United States, United Kingdom, France, and Sweden. While slums in the global north often escape the inquiry and discussion on slums, the challenge mostly remains the same for people who live in such conditions. It is just that the density of such communities is much lower than that of slums in the countries of the global south. Subsequently, we also coded the papers to identify how many of them focused on specific slums as case studies versus those that talked about slums at a city level or at a country level. It was observed that over half of the policy papers in our study studied slums at a city level and the other 30% or so at the country level. We observed that the country level studies primarily lacked the rigor and data on what was happening at the grassroots level. Only 16% of the papers focused on these case studies at a slum level, highlighting the need for more case studies to emerge in scholarly studies that capture the realities on the ground and highlight the challenges faced by slum communities in real time. It also highlighted the need to focus on single case, on single case slums to highlight the diversity in the typology and characteristics of slums uh, instead of adhering to the one-size-fits-all theory. At the same time, 
we observed that the primary focus of the eviction papers that we studied were mostly famous metropolitan cities from the global south, such as Bangkok, Delhi, Dhaka, and Jakarta, among others. This emphasis on the metropolitan cities clearly adds to the increasing metropolitan bias, which generally do not occupy the central focus of attention um, um, in policy implementation. Studies have shown that the incidences of poverty are higher in smaller cities than in metropolitan cities due to the combination of lower per capita income, lack of opportunities at the organized sector, and presence of few secondary activities in these non-metropolitan or smaller cities, where they also face the brunt of disproportionate policy attention and consequently resulted in resources that have been diverted to larger cities through affordable housing program. So for all the students here interested in urban studies, this is kind of a plug-in of a huge gap in literature to focus on slum case studies at non-metropolitan cities. This is an exciting and relatively unexplored area to focus on such slum case studies either at a thesis or a capstone level. The next theme focuses on identifying the primary triggers and justifications given by the authorities for evictions. The list shows a large evidence base of the justifications or triggers for evictions that we covered so far. We found that the primary triggers or justifications for evictions of slums from city limits were mostly focused on city beautification, mega sporting events such as the Olympics, Commonwealth or the Asian Games, um, ethnic violence against minority groups, and development pressures and increasing land prices among many others. Each trigger in itself had a very interesting story to share. Once we identified the triggers, we took it as a task to consolidate the emerging themes from all of these studies. In this process, we tried to create a taxonomy or a typology of these various themes. Um, in the case of evictions, we came up with three themes on the basis of which the triggers could be classified. Acute triggers were those associated with one-off events and those that happened on a short notice, often without, the, often without any intimation or adequate time given to slum communities before evictions. Uh, acute triggers include dignitary visits, such as that of that of Donald Trump in Ahmedabad in 2020, or mega sporting events, such as that of the Commonwealth Games in New Delhi in 2010. These events are mostly associated with human rights violences that commonly occur in countries of the global south. Chronic triggers are those that occur over time in a lengthy process, that also involve the slum communities in some way and involve other stakeholders such as NGOs and activists in the process. Evictions occur with the excuse of succumbing to increasing land prices and market forces or city beautifications. For example, residents of Dharavi in Mumbai have been involved in the slum, resident, in the slum redevelopment process through the SRA program, despite the own share of hurdles that they have been facing for decades. And then we've had hybrid triggers where the evictions, uh, though happening in the name of an event, were often seen as a justification for long-term development. Infrastructure projects such as expansion of roads and railway networks were examples of such triggers. So to give a better understanding of what kind of papers we have been going through and what individual case studies can teach us, I thought of bringing forward two case studies from different corners of the world and in a different timeline. The first case study is a classic example of an acute trigger that happened during the emergency period in 1975 in New Delhi. Massive demolitions were carried out in the Jama Masjid, Karol Bagh areas of Delhi, done on the orders of Sanjay Gandhi, whose only claim to power was that he was the prime minister's son, while having no responsible position in the administrative setup of Delhi. Now, these evictions mostly happened because of the community's support to the, to the Jan Sang, a rival political party extended by some traders and the Muslims who were thought to impede his beautified Delhi plan. Thus, the bulldozers were sent in. The Karolbak shops were raged because Sanjay had not received a warm enough reception when he had gone there. And slums near Gurgaon were raged as they made his car to slow down while he drove to the Maruti factory from his mother's farmhouse in Mehroli. To ensure that the affected people did not approach the courts for redress or seek the intervention of political leaders, the demolitions were deliberately carried out like a blitzkrieg without any advanced intimation, 
with the police squad to intimidate and overawe the victims. Now, this was a classic example of the kind of evictions that has continued to this day across cities in the world where slum communities face the extreme nature of human rights violations. At the same time, the second case study I wanted to talk about is something that is happening in this very decade in a first world country such as France. Um, in France, many Bulgarian and Romanian Roma migrants are being deported back to their home country, while certain selected families, however, get rehoused in what they call as integration villages, which involves the residents of the place living in clusters of used caravans that have been provided by the city. Now, proponents of these spaces have declared that they are humanitarian solutions to the existence of Roma slums in urban peripheries of many French cities. Yet, the creation of a healthy space for Roma migrants in the city has also legitimized the further eviction and exclusion of the people. Though the majority of Roma people in the city have regular jobs and do not live in poverty, local politicians commonly invoke the presence of Roma living in these unhealthy slums to legitimate their eviction and exclusion from social services. The creation of such integration villages for these Roma communities led to further evictions of Romas from the French cities, linking the immigrants to criminality, calling it a public health risk, making all the more difficult for the migrant communities to assimilate. Settlements of such migrant communities, mostly from Western Europe, have been observed in cities all across Europe. And then finally, the third theme I wanted to focus in today's presentation was the interesting use of linguistics by those in power as a tool to exercise their power. We coded all the terms used by government officials, bureaucrats, and politicians towards slums and evictions, highlighting their rhetorics. We could clearly see two clear trends in the nature of words that we found from our papers. The first were the words that, have a, that had a negative connotation, such as, uh, and all of these words were directed towards talking about slums, right? So there were terms like cancerous growth, ISOs, war on crime, or cleansing the city of criminals, the implication of all of which meant that some kind of... Well, what was the treatment? The immediate eviction and removal of slums. And at the same time, the second type of phrases particularly focused on terms that meant on some kind of war level effort necessary to remove the negative phenomenon happening in these cities, apparent with terms such as operation, restore order, or slum free cities, or orderly urbanization, as if it was not possible to have orderly urbanization in the presence of slums. Such phrases often became the tagline or catchphrases of many programs, uh, such as that of the slum free, 20 by, slum, uh, slum free city by 2020, which was the key catchphrase of the Rajiv Vavas Yojana when implemented in 2008. While we are no way close to achieve our stated objectives, we can provide a preliminary conclusion to the emergent themes that we observed in these papers so far. Uh, first, it seemed Asia and Africa have routinely carried out evictions and have also been the subject of studies with being with extensively being reported, which is a great thing. Our, our review shows a ripe opportunity for researchers to carry out individual slum level case studies in understudied regions, such as those of medium and small towns in India and elsewhere. Second, we found that the systematic review revealed that the focus of attention has always been to benefit other communities and not the slum dwellers themselves, where triggers uh, that we observed have always been about others. For example, city beautification was, tri was targeted to appease the middle and the upper class. You have sporting events that primarily for the global audiences. Very rarely we've observed triggers that were because that focused on the health and well-being of the slum dwellers themselves. And finally, we observed that linguistics have been used as a powerful tool for rhetorics against slum dwellers. Disease formulation uh, suggested some kind of a surgery and hence removal. But at the same time, the war and mission kind of formulation suggested some kind of urgency and hence the lack of time for people's participation in such a process. As mentioned before, the presentation today only highlighted the findings from the three, uh, from the three themes. We found very interesting findings in the other themes as well. 
just to give a brief preview as such um in the cases of modes of evictions we found that there has been a wide uh, array of modes that have been used from the use of arson to bulldozers to even the voluntary resettlements of communities in certain cases uh, because of natural calamities as for impacts we found that studies have highlighted the multiple impacts of, of on evictions of evictions on slum communities so ranging from physical and material losses to psychological impacts and finally while identifying the role of different stakeholders involved in evictions we found some interesting cases such as uh, as an example uh, the high court of delhi played an active enabler of evictions um, before the commonwealth games in 2010 so um our plan as such is to finish this analysis for all the policy papers and to create this database which uh, in zotero available in the public domain for all the scholars who are interested to pursue research in slum studies uh with this i end my presentation and request you all to share your comments and feedback on how you think we can refine this project further thank you thank you namesh for this wonderful presentation sure. the forum is open as namesh said so uh, you can either raise your hand or directly you know uh, come in and ask questions there's one hand who has raised yeah hi dritiman yeah dritiman you can Trithiman, you can. You are. You have to unmute yourself. Yes, I have some issues. Yeah, looks like. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, yes. I I was unable to unmute for some reason. Uh, I I actually just uh, I thank you for this really interesting presentation. I really enjoyed going through it. I I wanted to actually have this personal question mm -hmm. to understand how would the power of this study that you've done like the, as a systemic uh, like would it would it be like. Uh, um, like in terms of replicability of results right mm -hmm. so uh, would you consider a meta analysis after this yes that's the right. idea yes okay so i want to also understand uh, uh, how could the results of this uh, systemic systematic review mm -hmm. be uh, be used to understand uh, how how it can contribute to the sdg 11 uh, indicators you know mm -hmm. they have a set of six indicators sure. so yeah and like how would the results of this study uh help uh let's say in increasing the percentage scores mm -hmm. of each of these indicators mm -hmm. no sure and thank you dhritiman uh from what i understand for each of these in the, for each of the indicators that are identified by sdgs are kind of uh, have been taken care or are being targeted to be taken care by programs that have been implemented um in slums uh, each targeting a different intervention as such so the idea of this kind of systematic review was to provide some kind of a i won't say guidelines as such but more of a take away lessons that okay if a policy maker decides that in his particular city in his or her particular city he feels that okay there is a particular case and there that there are large scale events of slums and he wants to mitigate um in certain way possible so we want to provide a certain take away that you know if yours is the if you have a city that you are living in a let's say area of 3 to 5 lakhs and your pop and the percentage of slums that you have in the city is so and so then based on the literature that has been on slums since the past 5 decades this is the best possible solution that you can go for right or based on if you are if your if your slums primarily 
if the slums in the city have primarily uh, located are located by the drain as an example then we hope to provide an evidence base that in the hist like in history for such of for slums having similar kinds of backgrounds these were the kind of interventions that were used to take care and to resolve such issues and at the same time also identify any kind of mis i won't say mistakes but failures that have been listed and recorded in the past so that was the basic idea and the intention when we started working on this project um and even the same like even while even while working on evictions we came across various themes in terms of highlighting uh, how in what way evictions have been justified and at the same time we also we could see like if at all evictions had to be done we came across certain cases in which the communities happily were like uh, collaborated with the government for resettle from one location to the other so highlighting such cases we thought could provide some kind of a framework for policy makers and other stakeholders to mitigate such challenges i don't know if that answered your question jyoti ma'am Uh, Zitwan, you're on mute again. Yeah, it looks like yeah, yeah, yeah. technical. In the meantime, I <laughs> formal, think yeah, 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 formal as a question. Formal as a question. Yeah. Komal, you can unmute yourself and then ask your question. yeah hi um yeah, hi. actually in the beginning it just shows that host is not allowing to unmute and the chat is also disabled so i think that's what's happening with rishma uh, as well um uh, okay so i tried three four times and then um, <laughs> it was allowed anyway so namesh that was i i mean very uh, informative in fact we Thanks. hear all this uh, so i have a two part question slash comment Um, sure. First of all, like we hear all the time in the news, you know, you know this kind mm. of, I and mean, even movies are made where you know mm. slum dwellers are evicted in sure. uh, evil ways, and also it's good to mm. have a. It will be good to have a database for as a ready reference. Mm. Um, it will also be good to know if there was some actually successful uh, policies that were implemented, and probably you can include that in your presentation Absolutely. later, mm -hmm. because. Um, it looks like so far like as you just mentioned with the man that there were some successes but it from your presentation it just looked like that um, slum dwellers were never happy or mm -hmm. um, in in some sort of that impression all right sure that's one thing secondly um, after this re um, lit review mm -hmm. uh, are you also going to access some sort of data is there some data that specially deals with slums um, which you will deal with or which probably you can point um, the researchers too in your uh, paper some sort of like that thing uh to answer the first question i think yes it perfectly makes sense to list the successful policies as well um i guess i had so many thoughts in terms of to identify what to cram here and not so in, <laughs> yeah, sure. in many ways i guess i ended up missing the successful policies but then yes there have been a good share of micro level policies if i can state uh, that have been successful the only challenge or to not only challenge the biggest challenge with such kind of policies is that the they have started uh, that they have failed the moment when you tried scaling it up right okay. and that's one of the problems that we have been witnessing across multiple successful interventions in the world and okay. with respect to the second point on also listing out databases as of now i think what uh, the intention is to just uh, create this big database uh, which has an which has an a comprehensive list of all the papers like reviewed and to show where the directions are but i think it's a great idea even to list out um, available data sets that are there uh, from different sources and uh, and stakeholders as such now i think that's a great suggestion I'm glad thank you so okay. much yeah thanks namish yeah Dritiman, if you want to come back. Uh... No, no, I'm good now. Thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so. Okay, I think we all get to go early today.
Yeah, <laughs> looks like <laughs> that's great. Komal still has her hands up. Komal, any more questions? <laughs> oh no, no, I forgot to lower. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It does. It doesn't show that my hand is up. <laughs> that's why. Any other any other comments? Anything else? I think then we'll end here, Namesh. Yeah, anything perfect. else that you want to add or anything that you want to say at the end? Otherwise, then no, I think this yeah. was all. Thank you so all much for all those who had come. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for attending this. Uh, thanks, Gita. Thanks, thank Amish. you. Thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Gita. Thanks. Thanks, Shank. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Shubham, you can stop the uh, recording.